Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, amma ba'd. Welcome to the second week of Sahih al-Bukhari. There's a lot to cover, so I'm going to get right into it. Let's do a little bit of biography. So there's so much going on in the seminar. There's biography, there's studying the hadith themselves, and there's looking at the methodology of the Muhaddithin and Imam al-Bukhari. So let's talk about his early life today. Um, this, um, most of the material that I'm getting from, and it's remarkable work, if you're interested in um, a lot of these introductory concepts, not all of them are from the book, but the best book on the Sahih Bukhari is what? Anyone know? The best book about the Sahih almost by unanimous consensus. Fath al-Bari, yeah, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani's Fath al-Bari. There's no better uh, uh, sharh or commentary written on Sahih al-Bukhari that's as exhaustive, <clears throat> that has as much benefit as Fath al-Bari. And people joke, uh, there's a scholarly saying, it's a hadith, there's a hadith, La hijrata ba'd al-Fath, which means there's no hijra after Fath. And Fath is what in this hadith? Is, well, who knows what Fath is? The Prophet said there is no hijrah after the Fath. Conquest of what? What is the Prophet's Fath? Makkah, yeah. So after the conquest of Makkah, the hijrah as a global institution affecting the whole Ummah was shut down. So people use that hadith and they apply it to Fath al-Bari because the name of this book is Fath al-Bari. So they say there's no running away or escaping Fath al-Bari because of how important this work is. So this particular work, uh, uh, yeah, so Ibn Hajar, volume one of this book is very, very important, is sometimes published separately under the name Huda Asari. So if this is, I have it here in my hand. So this is Fath al-Bari volume one. If you look on the side, the name of volume one is Huda Asari. It's also read as Hadi Asari, Muqaddimat Fath al Bari. So it's a one volume book that looks at a lot of these topics that I'll be discussing. It covers the biography of Imam al Bukhari, it covers his methodology in choosing narrators, it covers a number of hadith in the book. It's a lot of useful research. And this is Ibn Hajar's research into Fath al Bari. Uh, into, sorry, Sahih al-Bukhari. And so most of the biography I'm taking from here is it's very exhaustive, it's easy to read. Um, so if you're interested in the future pursuing further studies, you have to read this one volume work. So early life of Imam Bukhari, Ibn Hajar mentions that Bukhari became blind as a child and his mother used to pray for him immensely. She later saw in a dream that Ibrahim, Ibrahim, who is Ibrahim? So Bukhari's name is Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim. Therefore, Ibrahim was a grandfather. So he came to her and announced that her son would see again due to her prayers. And when she awoke, that was the case. So it was a temporary disability on the part of Imam al-Bukhari. Um, what else do we know about his early life? So Farabri, his best student, one of his best students, he heard Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim, who was the scribe or paper maker of Bukhari. So a lot of the early details or the biographical details from Bukhari, we learn or they're narrated through his students and particularly the one who accompanied him his own whole life. So his paper maker, um, I believe the term is Warraq, so these are the people that you employ to dictate your books and notes to. And generally they're kind of like servants and companions. They accompany you your entire life. So Bukhari's waraq was Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim. So many of these intimate details about his life and those interesting anecdotes we get from him. So he says, Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim, he says, I heard Bukhari admit once that he was inspired to memorize hadith when he was in the Qutab. Qutab are the primary schools. Um, so like Maktab or Qutab are the primary schools in the Masajid that would teach the children 
you know, basic surahs and Quranic memorization, the early studies. So Bukhari, and from this admission, we learned that he had an interest in hadith from a very early time when he was a child. And he said he started attending the circles of a local hadith scholar, and his name was Ad-Dakhili. And Ad-Dakhili was local. So from here, we learn a lot of things. Among them is that Bukhari started local. Although he's widely known, um, or he's known as someone who widely traveled for hadith, and there's a romantic notion of traveling for the sake of knowledge. But all the great travelers, if you look at their life, they traveled at some point in their life, but they always started locally. So Imam Bukhari he absorbed the knowledge in the local schools and from the local teachers. Only after he absorbed all that knowledge did he look outwards and begin, begin to travel. So Ad-Dakhili was one of his local teachers, and that's the famous incident where Bukhari corrected the teacher. No, this hadith is not like this, it's like this, uh, correcting a narrator. And the, and the teacher insisted, and the Bukhari asked, then Bukhari asked him to review his notes. So the teacher eventually, he went back and he produced his notes, he went through them and he found that Bukhari was right. And then he came to Bukhari, admitted that he was right, and that shows, you know, like, the humility of certain teachers. There are some teachers that ego prevents you from doing that. If you're wrong, your students, when they correct you, of course, the whole thing has to be respectful. Um, if it's not done respectfully, it's counterproductive. So he came out and then he asked, he started reviewing with Bukhari and started correcting many of his mistakes. So he started using Bukhari for advice. And Bukhari says, how old was he? How old do you think he was at this incident? Um, this incident that shows his early genius. So you can see signs of genius early on when scholars or great minds, you know, they achieve something great, but it's usually the ingredients are there in early childhood. Anyone want to guess the age of Bukhari at this incident? He was 11. So he was 11 years old when this incident happened. He was correcting his teacher, and it was from memory. Bukhari didn't have his notes. From memory, he was saying, no, this is such and such a narrator, he narrates from such and such. And the teacher admitted uh, that he was right, and he used Bukhari to correct some of his original notes. So, and Bukhari himself wrote and confessed, when I turned 16, I had memorized all the books of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak and Waqiyah ibn al-Jarrah, early muhaddithin. And I knew all the opinions of the people of Iraq, the Ra'i of the people of Ahl al-Iraq. What does that mean? It means the people of Kufa and Basra. It means their fiqh fatawa, their fiqh opinions. Which means, what is a school of fiqh that comes from Iraq? Hanafi school. So, and not only Hanafi school, many other schools that died out. Sufyan al Thori school died out. Uh, Imam al Awza'i school died out. So many schools died out. Um, but Imam Bukhari, what do you know from that, that statement? He had memorized most of the hadith and he had memorized fiqh. So there are two things side by side you have to understand with Bukhari. I'm going to make that point later today too. Bukhari is not known for hadith alone. He's known for fiqh as well. So as a young child, he had memorized all of fiqh. He knew the opinions of people and he knew hadith as well. His first trip was to Hajj when his mother and older brother, with his mother and older brother in the year 210 of the Hijri calendar. And he was born in 194, so that makes him 16. At 16, he made the Hajj. And that's where his interest in traveling was sparked. And he wound up staying in the Hajjaz while his mother and brother came back. He met many high teachers, like Yazid ibn Harun, Abu Dawood at Tayalisi, not the Abu Dawood of the six books, He's younger than Bukhari, but Abu Dawood al-Tayalisi was another great muhaddith. He also went to meet Abdul Razak al sanaani one of the earliest figures. So one of the things about Bukhari is that he met people from history. Among the six teachers, muhaddithin, he's the one with the highest chains. He met people Muslim did not meet. He met people some of the other muhaddithin did not meet. So his sources of knowledge were much earlier than the others. So among the six, he has much higher, more historical, it's not. So Abdul Razak Sanaani is a great muhaddith from previous generation. 
And he went out to meet him. And then on the way, someone told him Abdul Razak died. So then he turned back. And later he found out he was alive and there was a rumor. So he, he regretted that. So, but he never was able to make that journey again. So he never met Abdul Razak, but he narrates the hadith of Abdul Razak through his student, through a student of his. At the age of 18, Imam al Bukhari writes, I authored a book called Qadaya of Sahaba wa Tabi'een, the issue of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een. So the, by the age of 18, he already written a book um, on a topic. So it shows you he was a man of research. He's a man of hadith, he's a man of fiqh, but he's also a man of critical research. He's not just memorizing. Um, and he's already authored a book at the age of 18. He said shortly after that, that same age, he said, I authored another book called at tarikh And I wrote that book sitting next to the grave of the Prophet in Medina. And he said, I used to work on it at night when the moon was out. This is before electricity. So in the night, there's dark. You can't do anything. So you could only work on the book when the moon was out and use the moonlight to write that book. Can you imagine a book written in Medina next to the grave of the Prophet written in the bark of moonlight. What an amazing you know, circumstance that is. And At-Tariq of Bukhari is one of the you know, references in Hadith. At-Tariq al-Kabir and At-Tariq al-Saghir. So it's a book of transmitters and it's still today when you research, when you reference things, often you'll find the reference. Bukhari relates this in At-Tariq, especially in biographical um, details. Um, and that was written at the age of 18. Sahl ibn Asari relates that Bukhari told him, I traveled to Syria, Egypt, and Hijaz twice, and to Basra four times. I stayed in Hijaz for six years, and I could not count how many times I traveled to Kufa and Baghdad with Hadith scholars. So just the travel of the Muhaddithin was such an amazing enterprise. They would travel from Hijaz, they find out, oh, there's a teacher visiting Kufa or in Baghdad, and he has certain hadith. They would travel from there, take weeks to get to Kufa, and then sit with the scholar or study, and then come back. And then they'll find out something else, they'll go back. So they'll go back and forth. These networks of travel are extensive. You ever see one of these maps that are made of the travels of Imam Ahmad, or the travels of you know, Bukhari and others, or Abu Hatim al-Razi, it's incredible. You see incredible ground being covered. Um, Hashid ibn Ismail relates that Bukhari as a young boy used to travel with us um, to the senior scholars of Basra. And he says, oh, Bukhari used to hang out with us, like to, he used us to travel. So often when you travel, you find another group of scholars going and you accompany them. Or you find out such and such, there's a caravan going uh, for hadith and then you go with them. Bukhari was a young boy, barely at puberty, no facial hair, and he goes with these senior students. And Hashid says, you know, this young boy was with us, and he was attending all the classes, but he never wrote anything down. And we were just like looking down on him, like this, boy, this guy isn't serious. He's, he traveled all this way for, with us, and now he's just sitting and just listening, but not writing a single note down. I see some of you doing that in my classes. Um, so then they scold him. The one day after a few days, they sat down and said, look, man, young boy, why are you wasting your time? Go do something else. He came all the way to Basra with us, um, and that's pretty far from where you are in, 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 in Persia, in, in the Khurasan area. So, and you're not writing anything down. You should benefit from, from these journeys. So Bukhari said, okay, bring your notes. So they brought their notes, and, he's, and he said, how many hadith you got? And he said, we have 15,000 hadith we wrote down so far in these classes. And Bukhari said, okay, open your notes. And he started reading the hadith from the first hadith and going on and on and on, page after page. And these people, they said, we were shocked. And he said, sometimes we had something different. And he said, no, that's a mistake. And then when the other people checked their notes, they were right. So they began to correct their notes just from his memory. So that's the kind of memory that he had. He was just someone who was blessed. He had photographic memory. There's something incredible, and he was very, very young. Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash 
another great scholar, he said, we used to write from the 18-year-old Bukhari while he was beardless at the door of Muhammad bin Yusuf al-Faryabi. So, you know, another incident. People are asking him to relate hadith and they're writing him down because they realize who he was in his memory. Um, Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim, the scribe, the paper maker, he says, Bukhari told us, I was sitting in the circle of Faryabi and I relate, and he related, Sufyan related to us from Abu Urwa, from Abu Khatib, from Abu Hamza. So everyone knew Sufyan, but no one knew these names. So the teacher asked, who is Abu Urwa? Who's Abu Khatib and who's Abu Hamza? So when you have kunyas, it becomes vague, right, who the person is. And often, sometimes teachers narrate from transmitters through lesser known names. So Bukhari says no one in the audience knew who these people were. And then Bukhari, he said, I gave him the answer. I said, Abu Urwa is Ma'mar ibn Rashid. Abu Khatib is Qatada, the great scholar. Abu Hamza is Anas bin Malik, the companion. And the teacher was amazed and everyone used to be amazed because of that. So that's just a glimpse into his early life and just wanted to start with that. Um, this is not a biographical class, but still it's very important to know these things. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let us begin. Let's do something different. So let's begin by reading the hadith. Instead of doing it at the end, let's read hadith number two. Discuss the hadith so we get some progress done in reading the sahih. And then um, we'll cover some of the material about the sahih that we want to cover. So hadith number two we're going to read today. Inshallah. So you have your own, you should have your copies of Sahih Bukhari. If you don't, um, we have several editions that we gave out. And also there's a new edition I have here. I talked about the Darut Ta'seel edition of Sahih Bukhari. So I printed out page one and two so you can see what it looks like. This is, <clears throat> this is a highly reputable edition. So whoever doesn't have one, come up and pick it up. So if you want, you can uh, give these out to the sisters. Two pages. So we read hadith number one. Now we're going to read hadith number two. So someone from the audience read the entire hadith in Arabic from one of these editions. Bismillah. Online students, I can't give you the pages, but I did give you the PDF in the Telegram group. So the Darul Ta'seel edition that I put on the Telegram group, volume one, this is just a copy of the first two pages, or the, or the first two hadith, rather. So what I want you to do with these, is try to look at the Arabic. Maybe read all of them, hadith one, hadith two, see which one flows better for you, which style you like better, which font you like better. These are reputable editions. It doesn't matter which one you use, whatever works for you. But you need to have a lifelong relationship with the Sahih. It's better to pick one now that, you're, that you can have for the rest of your life. So, um, Musa. Bab, haddathana Abdullah ibn Yusuf, qala akhbarana Malik, an Hisham ibn Urwa, an Abihi, an Aisha radiallahu anha. أم المؤمنين أن الحارثة ابن هشام رضي الله عنه سأل رسول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال يا رسول الله كيف يأتيك الوحي وحي 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 يا وحي فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أحيانا يأتيني مثل صلصلة الجرس وهو أشده علي فيفصم إذا يفصم ويفصم إذا يفصم okay yeah so mine I have فيفصم he has يفصم and someone has both yeah so that edition is very good the one that has both that means they're looking at all the different versions 
and they combine them for you. What does the Darut Ta'seel have? Somebody look. The one we just gave out now. Does it have a footnote there? The Darut Ta'seel is known for referencing all the different... Yeah, yeah, so footnote 5. The Darut Ta'seel edition, if you look at footnote 5, the Abil Waqt Fayyaf Yafsimu Wa Alayhi Sah. So, فَيُفْصَمُ فَيَفْصِمُ That's the two ways of reading it. So, that's the beauty of the Darat Asil edition. It'll tell you in the footnotes other ways of reading that are in other versions of Sahih. So, uh, the one I have doesn't have that footnote, but it's, it's just a beautiful edition, but, you know, so it's useful to have something that has these references. Okay, continue. فَيَفْصِمُ فَيُفْصَمُ فَيُفْصَمُ عني وقد وعيت عنه ما قال وأح وأحيانا يتمثل لي الملك رجلا فيكلمني فأعي ما يقول قالت عائشة رضي الله عنها ولقد رأيته ينزل عليه الوحي في اليوم الشديد البرد فَيُفْصِمُ عَنْهُ وَإِنَّ فَيُفْصِمُ or يَفْصِمُ فَيَفْصِمُ عَنْهُ وَإِنَّ جَبِينَهُ لَا يَتَفَصَّدَ لَا يَتَفَصَّدُ عَرَقَ عَرَقَ Okay, good. Jazakallah khair. So, فَيَفْصِمُ is what tense? So what's the difference? يُفْصَمُ and يَفْصِمُ Just Arabic students. Okay, good. Yafsimu, no, but that Yafsimu is Madaria. Yeah, so it's the present tense. And Yufsamu? Majhul, passive tense, so it's Mafahul. So it's just two ways of reading it. Uh, now, who has the English? Someone want to read the translation? Anyone have the English in there? Okay, go ahead, read the English, the entire hadith. Narrated Aisha, once the Prophet, wait, Narrated Aisha, the mother of the faith of believers, Al Harith ibn Hashim asked Allah's Apostle, O oh Allah's Apostle, how is the divine inspiration revealed to you? Allah's Apostle replied, Sometimes it is revealed like the ringing of a bell. This form of inspiration is the hardest of all. And then this state passes all after I have grasped what, I, what is inspired. Sometimes the angel comes in the form of a man and talks to me and I grasp whatever he says. Aisha anha added, Verily I saw the Prophet being inspired divinely on a very cold day and noticed the sweat dropping on his forehead as the inspiration was over. Okay, I need a volunteer to make an Isnad chart. So one of the things when you study Hadith, this is Sahih Bukhari. So in the English, you notice they don't give the Isnad. The Isnad is considered extra, unnecessary, or something like that. So, but the tragedy is when you're a student of Hadith, you have to study the Isnads as well. You learn so many things, um, like we mentioned in Hadith number one. So, um, so a volunteer just on the whiteboard here will just write the Isnad tree. So just starting with Bukhari and then the next name in a vertical format. Someone with good handwriting. Who has good handwriting? Okay. So somebody, um, so you can, if you're writing, somebody give him the name. So we'll put Bukhari on the bottom and then put a, yeah, that's fine. Put in a nice, uh, and someone give him his teacher's name. Abdullah bin Yusuf. Above? Above, yeah. Line, and then Abdullah bin Yusuf. And then above him, who's above him? Imam Malik. Put Imam Malik so people know.
And then, um, so Imam Malik, who's above Imam Malik? Hisham ibn Urwa. You have to put the full. Malik, and Hisham ibn Urwa. Who's above him? His father. So who's his father? Urwa what? You want to know his name? Huh? No. Ibn Masrud, no. That was Abdullah ibn Masrud. Who's Urwa? Yeah, Urwa ibn Zubair. And then, so Urwa ibn Zubair. Uh, don't space it out, that way we still have some more to go. <laughs> now bring the Urwa down. Yeah, yeah, just bring it closer to the arrow, that's it. We have one more link. So Urwa ibn Zubair, and then who's above Urwa ibn Zubair? Aisha, so Urwa ibn Zubair, then Aisha. Good. Above Aisha is the Prophet, so, so, so just put an arrow up. We don't have to write the Prophet's name, but it's understood. Okay. Okay, good. So, so, Let's focus on, so we need to learn the Isnads and the biographies. So this is the board for online students. But you can create your own Isnad tree. So the point here is we're looking at the Isnad now and discussing that. So who is Abdullah ibn Yusuf? So, so this is the teacher of who? Bukhari, right? So the first, when Bukhari says Haddathana something, that's the teacher of Bukhari. So, as we mentioned last week, um, we looked at his first teacher, and we mentioned that the fact that, who was the first teacher that Bukhari mentions in his book? Humaydi, Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Zubair al-Humaydi. He also, I mean, he's no relation, but it's a different generation. Abdullah ibn Zubair al-Humaydi. So, so Bukhari begins with that teacher, there must be some reason, and the reason we mentioned it was he was from Quraysh. Bukhari wanted to begin with Quraysh, just as a symbolic thing. And also, the chapter is how revelation began, so he wanted to begin with the Meccan teacher. And now, if that pattern fits, where should Abdullah bin Yusuf be from? Yes. So, so actually, so he's originally from Damascus, and he settled in Egypt, in a town, coastal city known as Tinnis. But he lived most of his life, or a lot of his life in Medina. He was one of the strongest students of Imam Malik. So, so Abdullah bin Yusuf took this hadith from Imam Malik, and he's a solid student. So you can say he's, he's also Medinan in that sense. So Bukhari begins with a Meccan teacher, and the second hadith he brings a Medinan Isnad. So Abdullah bin Yusuf, who was he? So, so who's above him? It's Imam Malik, right? So Imam Malik wrote what book? Muatta. So this hadith is from the Muatta. This is a hadith from the Muatta of Imam Malik. So the Muatta is a much earlier book. It's actually the first book of hadith ever compiled in an organized way. One of the remarkable books. Something needs to be studied as well. And the Muatta is one of the soundest books of hadith. It was one of the most sought after. Thousands of people, because that's the first time anyone compiled uh, a book of hadith, so it has, the, has a number of honors. It's the number one, it's the first. It's also the most authentic. It's not just the first, but it's also the, one of the soundest books of hadith. When you look at just a Nabawi hadith in there. Um, so, and then Imam Malik, the author himself was so famous and renowned. He was the Imam Ahl Sunnah. I mean, we can't even begin to talk about his biography. That'll take days and days and days. So someone so famous and pious, someone so, you know, uh, beloved and devoted to Medina, the city of the Prophet, he writes the first book of Hadith in our history, one of the best books of Hadith in our history, and one of the soundest books of hadith in our history. That's something amazing. So because of that, he spent 40 years of his life compiling the book, 
teaching the book and revising the book. And people would come to him and sit with him for 40 days and learn the muatta. And then he would tell them, look, it took me 40 years to write this. You got it from me in 40 days. You're not a scholar. Like, you can't, you can't even begin to appreciate uh, what's in this book. Um, so, teaching the, this, this book, the way that it is, as I described to you, where would he teach this book? Not in a random masjid. It was taught for 40 years where? Masjid the Nabawi. So that's something amazing. The, the genealogy of the Muatta is unbelievable. So he, saw it, he taught this book for decades in the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. People all around the world, thousands of people flocked to him to learn the Muatta. Kings, rulers came and learned the Muatta from him. Uh, khulafa, the children of rulers. Um, common people. Scholars, scholars of fiqh, scholars of hadith, every type of person you can imagine, young and old, would come and learn the muatta over time from Imam Malik. As a result, he has thousands and thousands of students. And the muatta today comes through many of his students. So we have many, many renditions of the muatta today. They all come from various students of his. And there are differences because it depends on the student at what time in his life he came to him and learned the muatta because he was constantly revising it. Also depends on what the student included. Some of the students included the commentary in the classes. Some of the students included their own commentary and so on and so forth. So uh, one of his students is, and so he has strong students and he has weak students. And students are divided into many tiers. The primary students of Imam Malik, secondary students, and then the students that just got the muatta but they're not real students or not strong students, they make mistakes. So Bukhari, basically, he learned the Muatta from the students of Malik. He didn't meet Malik, he was a previous generation, but he received the entire Muatta, he learned it from the students of Imam Malik. Not one, but many. And Bukhari narrated the Muatta through his Sahih. Most of the Muatta is in the Sahih. So in fact, so you can even consider a Shah Waliullah of India, he used to consider the Muatta to be the Asal, the prototype, and Bukhari and Muslim to be the continuations of that project. Because roughly speaking, they have the same methodology. Imam Malik has solid grasp of Hadith transmitters, and Bukhari and Muslim did not really disagree with him, they continued his project. So the entire Muatta, most of it is absorbed and narrated in the Sahih through the chain. So when you see Imam Bukhari narrating from a student through Imam Malik, that means this is one of the hadiths of the Muatta that got absorbed into the Sahih. So many of these early books, they get absorbed into later books. That's a phenomenon you need to be aware of because people bring up arguments, silly arguments like, okay, where's the book of Abu Hanif? Where's the book of this scholar or that scholar? How come we don't have it today? The reason we don't have it today is we actually have it today because these books were transmitted and then absorbed into larger books. Most of these early hadith books got absorbed in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, almost entirely. So the books do exist, but they just change shape because now the author, they compile them into larger books. So, so Imam uh, Malik, he had solid students, some of his top students, one of his top students, according to Shaykh Akram, or his, in his estimate, his top student was Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi. So one of his most reliable students, Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi. And Ibn Mahdi, yes. He's one of the early Muslims. Um, one of the Salaf, like he, he um, he's very, very well known, Abdurrahman Ibn Mahdi. Um, and one of his top students was Abdullah Ibn Yusuf at Tinisi. So Imam Bukhari received the Muatta through a number of teachers, a number of students of Malik, and two of them were strong and the rest were less strong. So the strong students of Malik that Imam Bukhari received the Mota through was Abdullah bin Yusuf at Tinisi. And then second one is Abdullah ibn Maslama al Qarnabi. You can just write Qarnabi. Al Qarnabi and Abdullah bin Yusuf. So generally speaking, Bukhari when he relates the hadith of the Mota or any other hadith for that matter, he'll take the top students. That's something people don't realize that it's not just random names, but they're looking for the top. So there's less mistakes. 
So whenever Bukhari relates a hadith of the Muatta, he always relates it through Abdullah bin Yusuf at Tanisi. And if he was going to repeat the hadith in his book, then he'll go the second time with Qarnabi. So he'll say, Haddathana Qarnabi, Haddathana Malik. Okay? And then when he has to repeat the hadith again for various matters, and we'll talk about his repetition of hadith, then he'll go with lesser known students, like his son-in-law, Ismail ibn Abi Uwais. He's a son-in-law of Imam Malik, but he wasn't that uh, strong as a student. He made mistakes. In fact, uh, Bukhari used to correct his mistakes, and he used to ask Bukhari, take my books and just correct them for me. So, but Bukhari will never narrate through Ismail ibn Abi Uwais directly. He'll narrate from the primary students, but sometime when you have to repeat a hadith for a different reason, you'll bring the other students. So Bukhari is like, a, you know, what he's doing is you, have, you need a mind, you need thinking to appreciate what he did. It's not just this hadith and these are the names, he just repeats them. There's a purpose in mind for between what he does. But for here, this is the second hadith of the Sahih. It comes through Abdullah bin Yusuf. So for you, need, you need to know Abdullah bin Yusuf, he died in the year 218. He was originally from Damascus, uh, settled in the Egyptian coastal city of Tinnis. That's why he has a title of Tinnisi. Yahya ibn Ma'in, an early hadith expert, said about him, "Ma baqi ala adim al ardi awthaku minhu fil muwatta." Yahya ibn Ma'in, friend of Imam Ahmad and one of the early experts, he said, "There's none that remains on the face of this planet that's more reliable in the muwatta than Abdullah bin Yusuf." So he was considered to be a very reliable student of Malik. Um, Bukhari said about him, Kana min athbatin shami'in. He's the most expert of the shami'in, the Syrian scholars. Bukhari met him in Egypt in 217, the year 217. So this is one of the senior teachers of Bukhari. And this places him above the other six muhaddithin because they have much more junior students. Many of the others... Um, hadithin, they narrate the hadith of the Muatta through a student of a student of Malik, two generations removed. Imam Bukhari manages to meet the students of Imam Malik, not just his students, but top students. Muslim does not meet him. Muslim does not narrate from the Muslim. Hadith of the Muatta that are in Sahih Muslim are lower by degree. Uh, Muslim does meet Ka'nabi, but Ka'nabi is not as strong as Abdullah bin Yusuf. So, you know, that's just something, so you need to start building these mental maps. And this is what Bukhari is doing, relating from Abdullah bin Yusuf, yes. How old was Abdullah bin Yusuf when he passed away? Allahu alam. Not sure. He was senior, so he must have been, he wasn't known to have died at a young age, so Allahu alam. So, so now you have, so Bukhari, so every Isnad, we need to make a chart, so you can start seeing history here. And they need to start learning their biographies, so one by one, like we did for the first hadith. So now the second hadith, Abdullah bin Yusuf, told you about him, and he's relating from Imam Malik. So Imam Malik, no need for a biography, um, but he died in the year 179. So this is a Muwatta hadith. Imam Malik narrates from Hisham ibn Urwa. Now let's jump to Hisham ibn Urwa. Hisham ibn Urwa died in the year 145 of the Hijri calendar. I'm going to use only Hijri dates. That's what makes sense in the Islamic tradition, especially in these generations. So now you can see when the numbers get smaller, it's closer and closer to the era of the Nabuwa. The other days don't make sense. The year 750, the year you know 800, they don't make sense in our tradition. So we need to get accustomed to the Hijri dates. So Hisham ibn Urwa, he's the son of Urwa ibn Zubay. So let's jump to Urwa ibn Zubay first. So we'll come back to the sun. So who is Urwa ibn Zubayr? He died in the year 94, the father of Hisham. Who remembers Urwa ibn Zubayr? He was in Hadith 101. In which uh, slide was he shared? Anyone remember? What is it? Nephew of who? Yeah, yeah, but like what slide? Like what context did I share his biography? Jurist of what? Yeah, the seven fuqaha of Medina. So what happened is, you know, Imam Malik, like his project is amazing. Um, so Imam Malik, he basically preserved the 
like Imam Malik being a lover of the Prophet Sallallahu he his his vision, his project was to pervert, preserve the practice, the amal, the religious practice and the customs of the Prophet Sallallahu And he took Medina as a prototype, rightfully so. That's where the Prophet lived, right? Medina was the first state. Medina was the center of Islam. That's where the Prophet Sallallahu did his work. That's where he implemented Islam. That's where Islam was established. So, so when the Prophet established Islam, Medina was still the center, even in the whole era of the Khulafa Rashidin, the four Khulafa, Abu Bakr, then Omar, then Uthman, it still was Medina was the center. And then Ali, Medina was still the center. So a city like that, that's the center of Islam, you know there's going to be benefit of Barakah, this is the city of the Prophet ﷺ. Just in terms of how people practice the deen, this is a city of Sunnah. So Imam Malik, what he sought to do, was to preserve that practice. So Ali, the fourth Khalifa Ali, towards the end of his reign, in the last five years of his life, he shifted the capital to Kufa. That's where things began to change. So he shifted to Kufa, but many great uh, scholars still remained in Medina. Who remained in Medina? Abu Huraira. Who remained in Medina? Aisha radiallahu anha. Who remained in Medina? All the Ummahat al muminin so they all remained in Medina. You know they lived many, many decades after the Prophet passed, Allah Sallam, teaching the Ummah. So Medina really was the center of Islam, the center of the Sunnah, the preservation of the Sunnah. So you had, you know, the Prophet, you had the companions, the Ummahat al muminin that stayed in Medina. Then you had the early Tabi'een, many of them were from Medina. Sa'id ibn Musayyib, one of the best. He was from Medina. And then after the Tabi'een, Coming back to the Sabah al Fuqaha al Medina, seven people in the generation after the Tabi'een, um, they became known as the people who preserved the knowledge of Medina. They're the seven jurists of Medina. And I shared with you two lines of poetry to allow you to memorize who they were. I won't test you because it's been a poor experiment. But who are the seven jurists of Medina? You're supposed to spit them out if you're serious as a student. Um, but anyway, Urwa ibn Zubayr was one of them. So these seven jurists of Medina, they're the ones who preserve the knowledge of Medina. People all around the world, when they needed to know something, this is where they would come. They would come to Medina to ask questions, learn Islam, learn the Sunnah, and bring it back to their lands. So, so Imam Malik, he lived in the generation after the seven jurists, not immediately after, but after. So. Seven jurists is Urwa ibn Zubayr. Imam Malik is one generation removed. Imam Malik, so what he sought to do, he found, he realized that Muslims were being spread out. And he realizes that there's a need to preserve the Sunnah, to preserve the Hadith. And he wanted to preserve the prototype of the Sunnah, which is Medina. So, and he really believed in redeeming value of the Amal Ahl al Medina, which was his principle that the practice of the people of Medina is the Sunnah. And for sure it was. Nobody can deny that. It's something even Ibn Taymiyyah recognizes and we all recognize. We're talking about early generations because this is where Islam was established. This is where all the great scholars were. So Imam Malik sought to establish the practice of Amal Ahl al Medina. Uh, that, that was his project with the Muatta. And when you look at the Muatta Hadith, a lot of them are coming, almost all of them are Medinan Isnads. They're coming from Medina, and they're going back to the great authorities of Medina, like the seven Fuqaha. So that's what we learn by looking at this. We're looking at, you know, Imam Malik's project, and you're looking at, you can see the history in the Isnad of the Muatta. Imam Malik is going back to the seven jurists of Medina. Uh, often, many of his Hadith are going back there. So it's, it's incredible um, when you start seeing the history and you realize, you appreciate what they were doing, what they were trying to do. And it was an amazing thing. And the traditions of Medina is something um, was very, very valuable. Imam Bukhari recognized. That's why Imam Bukhari learned the Muatta. Imam Bukhari preserved the Muatta through his Sahih and it's something, his project was validated. Um, so, and another factor, you can look at why Medina versus why didn't we did preserve the knowledge of other cities. All the other cities had like a lot of heresies and a lot of bid'ah and innovations. In Basra, you had the Qadari innovation, the free will people. 
in Kufa, you had all sorts of people, the Shia, the, and all of the Mu'tazila. So all these cities were full of fitna. And they had great scholars as well. But Medina was pure for many, many generations. There was no bid'ah that came out of Medina. So that's why Imam Malik wanted to, that was his project, to preserve the culture, which was the sunnah of the, the goes back to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And he did that remarkably well in the Muwatta and people uh, um, sought to learn that from him. So Imam Bukhari narrates this from Urwa ibn Zubayr, ultimately this is not uh, through Imam Malik. Urwa ibn Zubayr is one of the seven fuqaha of Medina. So Urwa ibn Zubayr, is, he has multiple sources of blessing. So who's his father? Zubair ibn al-Awwam. Zubair ibn al-Awwam, one of the people promised paradise. So his son is one of the seven fuqaha of Medina. So he's a tabari. His mother, who's his mother? Asma, daughter of Abu Bakr. So look at his lineage. Zubair ibn al-Awwam, the grandson of Abu Bakr, uh, Who's his aunt? Aisha. Who's his brother? Abdullah ibn Zubayr. So when you're coming back to the early levels in Isnad, you see amazing individuals. That's why we know this is highly authentic. These, this information we get, this knowledge, absolutely authentic. So Urwa ibn Zubayr, great individual. Then his son, Hisham ibn Urwa, he was a junior Tabiri. He's also from the generation of the Tabirin. He met Ibn Omar, he met Jabir ibn Abdullah, and he became the teacher of Malik, the teacher of Abu Hanifa, teacher of Shu'ba. Eventually he died in Baghdad. So he's someone who was a son of Urwa ibn Zubayr. He transmitted his knowledge from him. And Imam Malik and many others, they, that was you know, their, their teacher. And they sought through him to learn the knowledge of the early Muslims. Urwa ibn Zubayr narrates from his aunt. This is a family of So you have father, you have uh, Hisham, narrates from his father, his father narrates from his aunt. There's so many lessons here. So he narrates from Aisha. Urwa ibn Zubayr is one of the strong students of Aisha radiallahu anha. And Aisha, of course, no need for a biography, but just in his not perspective, her three top students are who? One of them is Urwa ibn Zubayr, her nephew. Number two, Amara bint Abdurrahman. She's a female scholar, one of the top students of Aisha. And another one from Kufa was Aswad ibn Yazid. Aswad ibn Yazid was also a top student of Aisha. He's from Kufa, so he goes and takes the knowledge of Aisha to uh, Kufa. And he's one of the, the progenitors of the Hanafi school. Abu Hanifa's teachers, teachers take knowledge from Aswad. So Abu Hanifa's teacher was Hamad. He relates from Ibrahim and Nakhari, and he relates mostly from Aswad and Al-Qama. And that goes through Ibn Mas'ud and Aisha. So, um, so that's the Isnad here. And then the Isnad continues, and I'll just share the names, and then, then we'll stop and take a break for Maghrib. So who's after that? Is there another name after that? Uh, so I want to go back to the hadith. What does Aisha say? Okay. Aisha says, Al Harish, uh, Al -ha uh, what's the name? I don't have the hadith in front of me. Okay. Al Harith ibn Hisham. He asked the Prophet. So this hadith goes from Aisha to Harith. So actually, the chain should go up further. So she says, Al-Harith asked the Prophet something. So who is Al-Harith? He's not that well known, but he died in the year 15, 1-5. So now, you know, we're at ground zero already. So Al-Harith ibn Hisham al-Makhzumi was the blood brother of Abu Jahl. Because Abu Jahl's name was, if anyone remembers his name, his real name was Amr ibn Hisham. 
This is Al Harith ibn Hisham. So they're brothers. So this is the brother of Abu Jahl, and he's a cousin of Khalid ibn al Walid. So he was actually with the Quraysh on the side of the Quraysh at the Battle of Badr. And he embraced Islam after Fatah Makkah. So he's the one that the Prophet gifted 100 camels during Hunayn. And some of the other companions, the ones who were closer to him, objected to that, that well known story. Um, anyway, Al Harith ibn Hisham, he, after Fatah Makkah, he became uh, a great companion. He attended all the battles in Syria and he was killed in the Battle of Yarmouk, uh, fighting the Romans. So he asked the Prophet an intelligent question here. What's the question in Arabic? So I'm going to read the question in Arabic. Just a question. And you can say it out loud. All of you can say it. Messenger of Allah, how does revelation come to you? How does revelation come to you? So we're going to take a pause for a moment. We'll think about that. And when we come back, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this question and the rest of the hadith. So we'll take a break for the Maghrib prayer, online students. 15 minute break. And we'll come back. Okay, Bismillah. Let's resume. I wanted to share. Um, so, our dear brother, Okay, Bismillah. Let's continue reading the hadith. So we mentioned that um, the brother of Abu Jahl, Al Harith, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Wahi. How does the revelation come to you? That's a strange question. So it may seem like a very interesting question. Uh, it may seem, what does it have to do with anything? Uh, um, or why do we need to know? But it's actually an intelligent question. I mean, had he not asked that question, we would not have that information. That's something so profound because, you know, much of what we learn from the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam from uh, about Islam, and it's a response to various questions. So, you know, this intelligent question, we get this amazing response, and this becomes hadith number two of Sahih Bukhari. And we learn things that are not in any other narration, otherwise we would not have this information. Um, so he asks, like, what's the nature of revelation? When you believe a man is a Nabi, Allah is speaking to him, naturally things come to your mind, like, Okay, how does Allah speak to you? Like, what is the nature of revelation, wahi? So it's a very intelligent question. How does wahi come to you? Because it's not seen. The Prophet is announcing to people, the, Allah revealed this and that. But no one really sees the process. Um, so it was a very, very good question. And it also shows you that questions like that... Um, you know, although they may seem like they're not central to guidance, but it's not like it's not wrong. The Prophet did not correct him or say that's not a question you should be asking. Um, it's kind of like what's the verse about uh, Ibrahim asked the question? Yeah, Rabbi Arini Oh Allah, my Lord, show me how you raise the dead. What did Allah say to him? Why you don't believe? What did he say? Of course I believe. Only to reinforce my heart. So, you know, these things increase your iman and faith and just knowing the nature, knowing about the angels, for instance. Although you're not going to see the angels, you have to believe in Allah. It's not central to your worship. But just knowing that information increases your faith. From that bab, from that perspective, it was a very good question. And we learned many more things from that. So what were... 
What was the answer of the Prophet ﷺ? What was the first line that he said? Someone read Arabic again. The first line. Yeah. Ahyanan ya'tini mithla salatil jars. The Prophet, sometimes it comes to me. What comes to me? In Revelation, that's the question. Sometimes it comes to me like the ringing of a bell. Sal salatil jars. So, that's something, when you think about it, like the sounds of bells, sal sala is chain. Like we mentioned in Tajweed class from last semester, that the word silsila is an onomatopoeia. It's an example of that, where the sound of the words expresses like, so silsila or sal sala is related to that. It has a metallic sound in the sounds of the words, the letters. So that metallic sound, that's what the, the bell is, is usually a brass or a metal bell where the central piece strikes the other. So it's, it's like a metallic sound. Tinnitus. This is good. Huh? Kind of like tinnitus. Yeah, I mean, tinnitus uh, could be different. Some people describe it like a buzzing or like, but yeah, so it could be like that. So, salsalatil jaras, sometimes like the ringing of a bell. So, you know, this is one description. And then what did he say about that? Wahua ashadduhu alayya. And that is the hardest to bear. That means there are different types of revelation. It comes, well, different ways revelation comes down. And the Prophet mentioned the hardest first. It comes down in a way where it's like the ringing of a bell. And this is the hardest of them all. And then he said, anni or waqad wa'itu anhu. And then it leaves me, the state, whatever is going on, this metaphysical process, the metallic sounds, it leaves me and I have grasped what was revealed to me. So, an amazing description. Um, you know, so that's one type of revelation that's very, very difficult and it comes and goes. And there's this description there. Um, and then the Prophet says, after that, وَقَالْ وَأَحْيَانًا uh, Well, he says, وَوَعِيتُ عَنْهُمْ أَقَالْ And I've grasped what was said to me. He said, أَحْيَانًا يَتَمَثَّلُ لِي الْمَلَكِ Sometimes the angel takes the form of رَجُلًا فَيُكَلِّمُنِي فَأَعِي مَا يَقُولُ Sometimes the angel comes with a revelation, the angel converts in the form, who's the angel? Jibreel changes into the form of a man and speaks to me directly. And that's much easier for him to bear. So these are two types of, um, the two manners of revelation that the Prophet described. One is an internal state, it comes into his heart, so intense for him, that's kind of, there's a metallic sound being produced. And the second is much easier where the angel comes in the form of a man just speaks to me. Qalat Aisha. Aisha adds her comments. So right now, who's speaking? Uh, Al-Harith. Al-Harith asked the Prophet and the Prophet is speaking. Al-Harith is quoting the Prophet Now at the end of the hadith, قالت Aisha. Aisha says, now she's adding additional details. وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُهُ يَنْزِلُ عَلَيْهِ الْوَحِي فِي الْيَوْمِ الشَّدِيدِ الْبَرْضِ I have seen him. By Allah, I have seen him. She doesn't say, Wallah. By Allah. وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُهُ I have surely seen him. While revelation is descending upon him on a day of intense cold, uh, and it leaves him, and when it leaves him, he is drenched in sweat. His forehead is drenched in sweat. So she describes that first process, the internal part. So she's in, you know, her description intense cold day, and the process so intense that after it's over sweat pouring from his uh, forehead so this is how revelation comes to the prophet so there are two types here that are described but there are three basic forms so the quran describes three so the, the prophet mentioned two he didn't mention the third but it's understood uh, so what are the there's a first uh, yeah there's a it's the verse, um, 
او من ورائي حجاب is in there um, who remembers if someone remembers the verse remind me like Allah does not speak why he does not come to a man except through uh, through a messenger or through a hijab yes so what's the beginning of the verse I always remember in this age I remember the endings of verses I never remember the beginning so the verse tells you the three that you know it does not behoove Allah to reveal to a man except through a messenger or through the heart and the third or to speak to him directly. So the three basic forms of revelation are direct communication from Allah to the human being, to the Prophet. Like Allah spoke to Musa and Allah spoke to our Prophet on the night of Isra. Or sometimes Allah speaks to the Prophets in the dreams directly. Like, uh, so it's direct communication. Huh? Well, yeah, Ru'ya Salihah is different. It could be part of it. Ru'ya Salihah, you see it, uh, something and it happens in real life. This is, the, we're talking about communication, Allah directly speaking. So, the first form of revelation, Allah directly, direct communication. Second form is through an angel, like Jibreel coming in various forms. And, like, or Jibreel appearing on his, in his original form with the 600 wings, that also happened. Or directly into the heart. So that's the three basic types of revelation, okay? Three basic forms of revealing uh, wahi, okay? In a, so in this hadith, he mentioned two, and the Quran mentions the third, all three. But there's additional descriptions that are described in when you look at other hadith and other reports. So other descriptions are the following. There's a hadith that describes the buzzing of bees. So in Musnad Imam Ahmad and others, so hadith where Umar ibn al-Khattab says, إِذَا نَزَلَ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ الْوَحِي يُسْمَعُ عِنْدَ وَجْهِهِ دَوِيٌّ كَدَوِيٌّ نَحْلٌ When revelation is come down to the Prophet وسلم, people around him heard like the buzzing of the bees. So the buzzing of the bees is another description of how revelation happened. This is from the experience of the one who's not being revealed to, is from the people around, right? Um, Ibn Hajar says the buzzing of the bees maybe is the same thing as Salat al-Jaras. Maybe depending on how close you were to the Prophet, there are different sounds that are described, but they're similar sounds. So he makes that observation, perhaps it's the same thing, perhaps it's a different. Uh, another word described is anafathu firrawa, blowing into the mind. That's another, but this is a, it's not one of the six books. It's in the, related by Ibn Abi Dunya, um, that inna roha al-qudusi nafatha fi ru'i. Verily the Holy Spirit whispers into my mind. Um, so blowing into the mind, blowing like uh, into the mind. Um, another word used as Imam Burhan mentioned, ilham, inspiration. Ilham is another type of, where it's an indirect way, but you're inspired to certain words and meaning. And also Imam Burhan mentioned, Ru'ya Saliha. So those are all, Ru'ya Saliha is a form of revelation. It's not a form of direct communication, but Ru'ya Saliha, where the Prophet made, where well, Allah made the Prophet see certain things and he would see them during the day happen. So like kind of like predictions, Ru'ya Saliha. So, and then direct speech like the clean. So, so basically, what's the, what's, so a couple of things we need to, to finish off this discussion. First, you have to appreciate how intense revelation was to the Prophet ﷺ. It wasn't something easy. You know, in English there's an expression, we talk about, oh, it's like revelation coming to me. Um, so for us, you know, just the idea of revelation is something automatic and easy. You know, it comes to me like revelation. But revelation is not easy. So from our tradition, we learn it's not easy. And there's a deep wisdom in that that uh, Ibn Hajar mentions, and he says that um, the point here is that anything worth its salt in the world requires effort and hardship. Nothing is going to be easy. If you get something easy, it's not something with barakah. Anything good or beneficial in the world comes with effort. So um, nothing will beneficial will come without effort. 
So even in England, we think, oh, revolution is just revelation is without any effort. It just comes automatic. It's not automatic. It's not without effort. Even the Prophet went through so much. So that is the wisdom of Quran Ibn Hajar that, you know, um, something that comes with that kind of effort and hardship is much more beneficial. That's what, that's what a person retains. Um, Ibn Hajar says, يُفْحَمُ مِنْهُ أَنَّ الْوَحِي كُلُّهُ شديد. We learn from this that all of revelation is shadid, is very intense. No such thing as easy re revelation. Um, and then Ibn Mas'ud described, and this is Hadith 5, but I'll just jump. كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يُعَالِجُ مِنَ التَّنْزِيلِ شِدَّةً The Prophet bore the revelation with incredible hardship. Like he went through hardship to bear the revelation. Because why? It was necessary to put him through that to appreciate and prepare him for the gravity of the words of Allah. And here there's a verse, we're going to reveal a heavy word to you. What's the verse? Yeah. Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. We are going to reveal to you a very heavy word. So revelation is not uh, easy. It's not something uh, trivial, it's something very serious. And all serious things require effort. That's why like when you, when you read a book and it has it's color coded, it's cartoons and it has charts for you, like my slides in Tajweed, that's why I don't have any real students. Like I'm still teaching Tajweed in 2023, right? Because I followed a wrong approach. I gave everything in form of digestible charts and. And the students don't go through the hardship of creating, trying to figure out the rules and creating their own charts, creating their own ways of looking at it. And that's why Imam Bukhari and early Muhaddithin, they traveled on foot for hundreds of miles. We can't even travel in the car, we get tired. They traveled on foot hundreds of miles, you know, thousands of miles, not even hundreds, and to learn hadith. And that's why they had them in here. The hadith were here. Today everything is on the apps. Everything is on like, you know, you can Google it and that's why there's no barakah, we don't remember anything. And that's the wisdom of this hadith that, you know, like you know, everything serious requires effort. So that's the higher wisdom of the hadith. And um, the final thing to say about this, and we'll take open the floor with questions is, so now think about the sahih, think about the chapter, now the broader picture. You always want to put it, link it with the broader picture, not just looking at hadith or verses of Quran atomistically, just like, you know, this is just an independent unit. Now try to think, why is this hadith number two? Why is this in this chapter? What does it have to do with the chapter? So now you have to go back, what's the name of the chapter? And then that's how, that's where the real insights and genius of Bukhari will come out. So this chapter is called what? Kaifakana Badul Wahi. How does revelation begin? And we mentioned the relation of this first, first chapter with the rest of the Sahih. Imam Bukhari wants to teach you this building blocks. He's taking you from the building block, building you up. So he's teaching that anything worth is salt is coming from revelation. That's a true source of knowledge. And that's why he's beginning with that. And then he's going to go to Kitab al-Iman. Even before Iman, you have to know what revelation is. If you don't know what revelation is, how can you have faith? So he's starting with the building blocks. And the first hadith, a lot of people, they write, well, it has no connection to the chapter, he just wanted to be the first. No, everything has a connection. So the first hadith, we mentioned how it was connected. What do we say, how it's connected to the beginning of Revelation? The hadith of Niyyah. What do you remember from that discussion? What is it? Yeah, it's sincerity, but how is it connected to the beginning of Revelation? Because many people argue, and many scholars even write, it has no connection, it doesn't fit there, but as a baraka, because intention is so important, sincerity is important, Imam Bukhari put it first, and all of us should have put it first in our books. But that misses the point. Yeah. Yeah, it has to do with ikhlas. Okay, yeah. The importance of ikhlas, but my question is, what's the importance of ikhlas? How is that connected to be revelation? 
How does it connect to this chapter? Huh? The Sanad? No, but that's not, that's a side point. That's just something he's doing from his genius mind. He's, he's, he's playing games with you, teaching you between the lines. But the lines themselves, that's not the essential point. The essential point is the hadith. I'm saying the content of the hadith. How is it connected to the beginning of Revelation, Daniel? So the revelation moves your niyyah to the direction you, it needs to go? Okay. It also has to do with student and the teacher. You know? I mean, but, it, but in the sense of that, um, uh, that Allah is sending his revelation to him. Um, uh, and there's this transference of knowledge you know, mm -hmm. between Allah and him, and then this same sort of sequence takes place throughout um, the revelation of the, of, um, the revelation coming down and coming to the prophets of the and, and, and so forth. Okay. Any sisters? Okay, so I mean the point here is let me I'll I'll do the board because I talked about it last week, but apparently I'm not a good explainer or you guys are not good listeners. Is it one of the two? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, so we talked about two things like there's structure and what? Purpose. So structure and purpose are two essential ingredients in religion. So you have to have a structure, you have to have purpose. And we mentioned Jews have structure but no purpose. Christians have purpose but little structure. Muslims have structure and purpose. Sahih al-Bukhari is teaching the structure of the deen and guidance. In a structural way, what the sunnah is going to teach you how to live. It's going to teach you, um, you know, how to pray and all the things you need to do, what the Prophet saw so I'm taught you. So that's the copy. Okay, this one didn't follow me. Okay. Why didn't it follow me? Okay. Yeah, so online students. All I wrote is structure plus purpose. So, Sahih Bukhari is going to teach you the structure of the deen. But that structure is meaningless without purpose. And in Islam, everything you do is meaningless without sincerity. This whole structure will only work with the purpose, with the sincerity. And there are verse after verse that reinforces that. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهُ مُخْلِسِينَ الْدِينَ We have only been commanded to worship Allah, the structure. مُخْلِسِينَ الْدِينَ With purpose. It's ikhlas. Verse after verse, uh, verse in Surah Al-Kahf, you know, um, the ending of Surah Al-Kahf, I blanked on the verse last year, last week, um, where Allah says, who will be the worst losers on the Day of Judgment? Aqsarina um, A'mala, the biggest losers. Those who are doing things, structure, thinking they were doing good, but they really didn't have the purpose, they didn't do, have the sincerity. So, the most important thing, so Bukhari's brilliant mind is trying to teach you sincerity is the end goal of the structure and it's also the starting point. Without that, it's not going to work. So you can't jump to Kitab al-Salah. You can't jump to Kitab al-Wudu. Imam Malik in the Muwatta, he's interested in preserving the Sunnah of the Deen. But he's not interested in teaching the building blocks. That's why the first chapter, Kitab al salah the timings of prayer, he wants you to pray. He's assuming that you have everything else down. Imam Bukhari is much grander in his vision. He's giving you the building block. He's a thinker. So he's giving you the building. So the first hadith has to do with reminding you of the end goal of revelation, structure, uh, purpose rather. And now this hadith, how is this hadith connected to that? This hadith is talking about the different types of forms of revelation. How is that be connected to Kitab Badul Wahi? 
I mean, it seems like a side point, but, um, and certainly there were scholars that said this hadith isn't really connected. Um, Structure. I look, I look at structure as, okay. as the Akai. Okay. Beliefs. Okay, but now we're talking about the second hadith. Ringing of the bell, sometimes a man comes. Yeah, but, I'm, I'm, but be, being connected to Allah brings all of that, those, those results of um, difficulty and struggle and perseverance and, and all those kinds of things. Because of the weight, of, as we were just saying, as because of the weight of the message, if you will, mm -hmm. it's not an easy. The, it's not an easy structure. It's not building it. Is not something that's simple, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and getting to know Allah is not something that's really simple, um, per se. Uh, and it comes with toil and struggle. I mean, I think, and that's touched on. You know, like even in in Iraq, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there was that struggle with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi struggling with Jibreel or his son. Right. So, I mean, look, there, there's no, like, we have to think about because this is a book of thinking. It requires a lot of reflection and deep thinking, but, like, so this hadith, second hadith is about the nature of revelation. So, you know, like, how does that establish where revelation, revelation is the message, right? But, like, why does it matter how it came to the Prophet? So it seems like it's a side point. So a lot of people had difficulty with this. Like, um, so Ismaili, a great scholar, he said, this hadith has nothing to do with the Bab, the chapter. But Ibn Hajar disagreed. He said that has something to do with it, but his explanation is so long-winded, it kind of like seems like a stretch. But when you really think about it, Shaykh Akram says, Bukhari knows what he's doing. It's more logical that he's perfectly logical. So he says like the first hadith, you know, about the sincerity establishes that prize of revelation, the end goal of revelation. What is wahi teaching you to do is to become sincere to Allah. So it's perfectly connected. And then the second is establishing the nature of revelation and it's, it's connected to that. You have to know the nature of revelation. So, so, so he makes a point that the way Bukhari writes is kind of like the way the Quran is structured. Quran doesn't follow that natural order, well, point A, and then you have supporting points, and then you go to the next paragraph. That's why a lot of non-Muslims or, or, or people who are not sincere, they criticize the Quran as a book that's not logically connected. But actually, the Quran is a more intuitive order, not a literary order. Same thing with Sahih al-Bukhari. The way he constructs it, it's an intuitive order, um, and not necessarily a literary order. When you write a book, like in modern times or many books, like there has to be an order. Like you have a primary point, supporting point, conclusion, things like that. But when you speak, you know, human beings, our minds don't work like that. That's an that's a unnatural way of writing. When you speak, kalam, it's a more natural order. It's a natural process. Um, so the Quran is very natural. So the Quran will teach you something, then go into a digression, then come back to that point. It's all connected, but it's connected in a different way than a normal literary way. Sahih Bukhari is kind of like that too. It's an intuitive connection, but it's not like a literary. So you know, if you don't understand that, then you misunderstand that, well, how is this connected? And all of us go through that. You might, if you have a hard time understanding that, if you ever like give a lecture, those who are involved in dawah and lectures and khutab and durus, like if you write an article, is very different than you giving a speech about the topic. And how so, if you give a speech, and now you have modern transcribing, right? Like, and so you can transcribe your lecture. Take any of your lecture that you give on a topic and let it get transcribed. Is this something ready to be published on a blog? No, because that's not a literary, when you speak, naturally your mind flows in a natural way. And sometimes you digress, sometimes you add a point, sometimes looking at the audience, you bring another point. So that order of oral speech is much more logical, more connected to the mind and heart. 
but the order of writing a book, now you're removed from that process, now you're writing it in a different way. It's a little more mechanical and more logical, but it's not that intuitive. So Imam Bukhari is not like that. He's, you know, an early hadithin, and early writers, they're writing more naturally. That's why their books look different from a modern book, what a modern book would look like. You know, with the opening point and a side point and a conclusion paragraph. Like if we were to write something like that, we would write the first chapter and we would explain how it's connected. Then you dumb down the mind. Like brilliant people don't think like that. And then, and we also, like when we give a lecture, it's always different from writing a blog. If I write like a topic, an article on sincerity, and I give you the lecture and I read my article to you, why do you fall asleep? When someone's reading from a book, why do you fall asleep? It's the same information. Because it's presented differently, it's presented for a reading audience. But when you speak to people, you need a more natural connection, more intuitive connection. That has to be a different way of speaking and writing. And that's how Sahih Bukhari is. That's how the Quran is. Allahu alam. So in that sense, it's not an essay, it's not a formal lecture, but it's perfectly logical. So he's now he's teaching you before you know and get to revelation, I need to know how hard it is. You need to know the nature of it, what it looks like, what it looked like to people around the Prophet Wasallam. And so he's building up your base. Wallahu a'lam. So I'm done with hadith number two. Now I can open the floor for questions before we wrap it up with the final topic on Sari Bukha. Anyone online, feel free to post. I'll make it a point to look at your comments. Um, yes. Just, just a, a, a statement. Mm -hmm. um, if the people who are bell ringers, the people who are bell ringers, yeah. and if you ever notice them, um, the people who ring the bell, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody, people know the story of Kazumoto, who was lived in the Notre Dame, and he was the bell ringer. And whenever the bell would ring, it would make him shrink. He would actually, he would become in a, in sometimes in a, in a swoon uh, from from the sound of the bell mm -hmm. and whatnot. And so, I mean, I kind of relate the story to that. And even the people who do that ring the bell, many of them become deaf to tone deaf, if you will, to to the environment around them and um, and. Um, uh, isn't that how the Day of Judgment is going to yeah. occur, right? Yeah. Kind of trumpet is slightly different, but it's also very similar too, right? It puts everyone in a state, like, you know, it kind of, that's why fire engine, or when there's a fire, what do you do? You have bells, like they're alarms, they're closer to bell sounds, because that wakes you up. So, so maybe that's, that's, that's I the wisdom. Relate with, when the Prophet said that that is the most, difficult one on him, you know, as a, of, of, of all of the ones that came to him, you know, that was the one that really, um, yeah, Allah. Penet penetrated him completely, Allah. you know. Just... Um, what, what about The early muhaddithin. Mm. No, I understand. Mm -hmm. Imam Bukhari? Yeah, so you're going to understand this topic. Um, with the next topic I'm about to, to so now the, the final topic is going to be what Bukhari was trying to do with this book. That's what people don't understand. If it was just a book of hadith, then all this doesn't make sense. He wouldn't be doing this. The books of hadith, like the Muatta, are not structured like this, or Sahih Muslim. Bukhari was doing something unique and different. So we'll, we'll look at that. Um, any questions on second hadith for now? And then with that, let me show you um, that the hadith book. Um, yeah. So, I want to 
acknowledge uh, my dear companion, my Ashab, Brother Sheikh Isma Ibrahim, and uh, Ismail, Ibrahim, Ibrahim, yeah, and Imam Burhan. These brothers are, are consider them dear and beloved companions. They always have these gems, and we're always learning from them. They've been on the Dawah scene from the 70s, and they've met incredible people. Um, Ibrahim always gives me these amazing books that are not in print, they're unbelievable. Um, every time I see him, he always has something new. He brought today Sahih Bukhari. Um, it's a different edition, it's very unique. It uh, has uh, footnotes of some Indian scholars, uh, Sahar and Puri and Sindhi. And the font is beautiful, it's out of print. Kandahlawi also, okay. So, you know, it has, I looked through the first and second hadith, it, Fayafsimu, Fayufsamu, it has a footnote. So it's very, you know, um, thoroughly researched. And if you want to take a look at, so it, it's a large, large volume. It's four volumes total. And uh, it's kind of out of print. So Sahih Bukhari, there's no book in human history that has as much attention devoted to it. Um, so you'll have many, many editions. You can't even put on paper how many editions are. There are so many that were published over the last thousands of years that maybe are not, they're out of print, they're being rediscovered all the time. So, you know, I can't give you the final word on the editions, right, Bukhari, but there's so many beautiful ones. And whatever you have, hold on to it. Um, because all of them have some benefits. Some of them have additional things. This has brief footnotes by various scholars. And then some of the other ones, like Darut Ta'asid, is a more contemporary one. Also very thoroughly researched. So, um, so Brother Ibrahim has this. So feel free during the class or after class, take a look at his print, and take a look at some of the other ones that, like, I always have them here in the front. Look at the Turkish edition that I have. Look at Imam Burhan has some interesting editions too. So he brought some as well. So any questions on the second print? Someone wants a picture of this. So somebody, if one of you can just take a picture of the cover of this book and one of the pages. Let one of the younger brothers do it. Um, and put it on the telegram. I mean, anytime during this class or after this class. So people online can see each other. Any questions? Yes, sister. No, so it's hard to say because uh, this whole revelation was an internal experience of the Prophet he, um, he, he shared the revelation with the rest of the people shortly after it was revealed, but not immediately. And he took a look how big the Quran is. That was all revealed throughout his life. So we can't really pinpoint which verse was revealed on which occasion. Maybe there's a handful of occasions that we know on this day this verse was revealed and the companions know what the prophet was doing but most of them we don't and also this ringing of the bell you have to make you have to realize that's not what the prophet was experiencing that's the people around him what he was experiencing is far more intense and more internal and allah alam what that process was that's uh that's an amazing thing that's one of the mysteries but but the ringing of the bell is a sound that Perhaps he heard along with people around him, but or the buzzing of the bees, but it's probably something far different internally. Allah Yeah. I have a brother, um, should be from Canada. No. Yeah, it's no leader. Yeah. Yeah. He Sheikh made, Abdullah Idris. Yeah. sound of, of the recitation of the Qur'an, actually, if you listen to it and you hear a lot of people reciting it, mm -hmm. it has that same buzzing sound that you hear that you know, that's it's spoken wow. about, you know, um, uh, uh, and, and, if you, and when you, if you listen to it, or if you're in a masjid sometimes, and there's a lot of people reciting the Qur'an, and you get that same sort of similar effect. Mm -hmm. Um, regarding a like a buzzing sound, yeah. Buzzing sound, yeah. Subhanallah, yeah. You know, I was in Toronto last weekend, and I prayed in the Isna Mosque, 
and um, there was an announcement, there was like a screen that had like the events of the Masjid, so Tuesday nights or something was stories of the Prophet by Abdul Dadri, so he's still active, mashallah. He's still giving lectures. I didn't meet him, but I saw his name. Yeah, so the bell is very interesting. There's so much association with revelation and like the buzzing, people reciting Quran and like these kutab, like children, and everyone's reciting in unison. There's this, this sounds like that. And maybe the qiraat or different riwayat has something to do with that. Allah alam, it's all a mystery. Someone else had a question? Ibad? For the bell, uh, well, the revelation that came that was that felt like a bell. Was the angel involved in that, or was that one of the other types that? Allah alam. I believe um, the angel is still involved in some way. We don't know exactly. Like it comes directly into the prophet's heart. Um, but is the angel bringing it down and involved in that process? Allah alam. Is different from the angel is exclusively communicating to the prophet just by like direct face to face come. But this internal process is a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Any other final questions? Okay. So, <clears throat> so alhamdulillah, we did hadith number one and hadith number two. So we're we're doing good. There's a total of seven or eight. I think I always forget. Someone want to check how many? Okay. So, that brings us to an important discussion about what makes Sahih Bukhari special, why Imam al-Bukhari compiled this book. We looked at a motivation last week, like, you know, to compile the authentic sunnah. So that was a motivation, and that was one of the purpose. But what really is a sahih? Um, what does it represent? So I mentioned in the biography two things to keep in mind when you when you consider Imam al Bukhari. Um, one is hadith, and second is fiqh. So Imam Bukhari was not just a muhaddith. Like a muhaddith, technically, is someone who is very well versed in the narrations and the reports. But it's not necessarily someone who knows how to derive information and insight and guidance from them. So there's a famous like, um, way of putting the difference that was related from a number of early scholars that they say that the muhaddithin are the pharmacists and the fuqaha jurists are the doctors. So muhaddithin and are the ones who have the building blocks, right? But the fuqaha are the ones that put it together and produce the medicine and the final result. So that has some truth to it, not entirely. Um, so generally that, that expression is used by people who are into fiqh and it's used to belittle the people of hadith. And so it's not that simple, but it's, it's kind of a good way of looking at it as a starting point because Real muhaddithin weren't just reporters. Like the fuqaha, some of them look down on the muhaddithin. They say, well, these people don't know anything. They're just memorizers. They just memorize reports. We're the ones who understand them. And then, but that's not entirely true because the muhaddithin, part of knowing the reports, you have to know how to evaluate them, what they mean, because like the, a lot of the conditions, like shav, it has to do with the content and meaning often. You don't know what they mean at all, then you won't even know if it's shaf. So it's not, not entirely true, but um, so, but the, so there is these broad two traditions: the hadith themselves, and then fiqh is deep understanding and insight. Allah says, "Man yurid," uh, the Prophet said rather, "So some of man yurid Allahu bihi khairan, yufaqihu fiddin." Whoever Allah desires good for, He makes him deeply insightful, gives him deep insight into the deen. So fiqh has a sense of deep insight. Although today fiqh is used for law, right? And rulings. That is what it is. But in fiqh really means like a deep understanding and insight. Knowing what revelation means. Knowing what reports mean. So Bukhari was an expert in both. Bukhari was not a pharmacist. 
He was a doctor and a pharma. He was, he was everything. He has deep command of language, deep understanding of reports, and deep understanding of what they mean and their implications. And so what he taught, sought to do by his... Um, so he wanted to do two things. He drew two broad purposes of the Sahih. One is what we alluded to last week. He wanted to purify the Sunnah and produce for you a compilation of the soundest of the prophetic reports. A Sahih Sahih. That's one purpose of the book. Give you the soundest evidences of your deen. The second purpose that people miss, that he not only did that, so Imam Muslim did that, right? And some other muhadithin did that. So they'll take the strongest reports, put them in a chapter, put them, present them to you. Here are the strongest reports. Bukhari did something far more amazing. So he did that simultaneously. He used those soundest reports to produce for you a whole conception of the religion, of the guidance. So he used those reports to extract juristic lessons, wisdoms, insights, multiple meanings, created this amazing work, intuitive order, with chapters and subheadings. So not just giving you hadith, but taking those hadith and constructing this broad vision of what guidance was. You could disagree on some of his points, or you could disagree on what guidance is on specific points, but you can't disagree that Imam Bukhari did something amazing with it. So it's not a typical book of hadith. It's something far more than that. And that's why when he relates hadith, he's, you know, drawing circles around you. Like, look at the first isna, the second isna. So it's not just he's using a makkan isna, he's still teaching the most strongest hadith, the strongest isna. But even with that, he's so brilliant, he's using that to do something much more. And because of that, one hadith in Sahih Bukhari, you'll find it repeated 12 times in different chapters that have nothing to do with each other. So what does that mean? That means Bukhari is looking at the, the, the hadith of the Prophet so using that as a guide, and the, and the verses of Quran, and drawing insights from them in different angles. From one hadith, he might have 12 different lessons, or 10 different lessons. You find that same hadith, a portion of the hadith in various chapters. So it's unbelievable what he did. It's remarkable. So that's why you need to understand, you know, his insights and what he was trying to do in order to understand all of this. Because there's a great saying, Fiqhul Bukhariyu, Fiqhul Bukhari fi tarajumi. So the re real insight of Imam al-Bukhari is in his tarajum, which are his chapter headings or the way he arranged the book. So this, you know, the more you study with that, the more it astonishes people, the best minds are amazed. Uh, only people with hearts are closed. They already have preconceived notions about who Bukhari was or, or Hadith, and they can appreciate that. But, you know, Fiqh al-Bukhari fi tarajumihi. The keen knowledge and insight of Bukhari is found in his chapter headings, in the organization of his book. So with that, uh, in mind, here is, okay, where is my slides? So this is a, the statement I mentioned, Fiqh al-Bukhari fi tarajumi. So, tarajum, I'll tell you what it is, but, so how is the book constructed and organized? Okay, so you have chapter divisions of Bukhari. So some chapters are untitled. They'll just have in front of them Bab. Okay? Some chapters have a very short title. Bab, one word. Or Bab of some. But many chapters have expanded titles. Right? Expanded titles. And these expanded titles are called Tarajum. Tarajum could mean biography, could mean the chapter heading, could mean that introduction. Um, so, so you need to understand, now I'm giving you an introduction to the structure of Sahih Bukhari. So we talked about his purpose and his vision, but the structure, how is this constructed? If you don't understand that, you're going to 
miss many things. You're going to misunderstand many things. So this way you need to realize the book is divided into kitab, like books. And each book is a broad topic, like kitab ul iman, and divided into many, many chapters, bab. And each chapter sometimes has subdivisions. So, so the way he divides the book, in the chapter headings, will give you a, like the title of the chapter that gives you an idea what he's thinking and what lessons he's deriving from those hadith. And sometimes in these chapter headings, it gives you much more than just a title. And these chapter headings are paragraphs. They're expanded. That's where he's giving you his opinions and giving you not only his opinions, but sharing with you other things. So that's something to keep in mind. Some chapters untitled just say Bab. Um, why that is, there's theories, but um, some chapters have very short titles. Like, Bab Kayfa Kana Bad'ul Wahi Ila Rasulillah So how did the relation begin? Relatively short. But some chapters have long, long, like it could be like half a page. in the chapter heading. So you need to understand that to begin to appreciate. Um, because he's trying to teach you many things. Um, so there's a lot of fiqh in Bukhari. There's a lot of a fatawa of different schools. You might say, well, it's a book of hadith. No, if you look in the chapter heading, there's so many opinions. And Bukhari is trying to teach you things and trying to teach you his conclusions, his research. So this is a broad conception. Now, moving beyond that, this is hugely important. Um, the next slide which has to do with the structure of the Sahih. Okay, so this is my chart, like, uh, reading about the Sahih over many, I didn't get this from anywhere, but just from reading and learning from Shaykh Akram and others. This is my summary of what the structure of Sahih al-Bukhari looks like. Um, and I kind of summarize many things here. So if you keep this in mind, again, I'm dumbing you down, I'm giving you colors, and I'm giving you charts. Um, but it is what it is, I don't know, I can't help myself. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, I'll tell you what I was thinking when I chose the colors. So, the dark colors are meant to show you what the Sahih is really about. So, what we call the primary corpus, that's dark blue. <clears throat> primary corpus is the essence of the book. In Arabic, we call it usul. So now no one is listening to me. Everyone's taking pictures of the screen and looking at all the text. See, that's, that's what I mean by dumbing you down. When you put a chart, then you ignore the teacher and you just start looking at the chart. So, <laughs> so I'll let you take pictures. Um, and then, but you need to listen. So, um, so the primary corpus. So, I mean... You'll have pictures of this. I'll put it on Telegram. Um, I'll put it for you. But I need you to understand the primary corporate, the usul of the book, is a sahih sahi reports. That's what he meant to compile for you. That's the highest tier sahih report. That's why I have it in dark green. So any hadith in Sahih Bukhari, if it's in the primary corpus, which is the usul, it is the highest level of authenticity and disputed. Okay. But now, because Bukhari is brilliant, he's doing much more with this, uh, with the Sahih than just providing you um, certain things. He's giving you much, much more. So he has supporting material. That's why the lesser shades in um, a lighter shade of blue. So he has supporting material. That supporting material is not part of his primary corpus. You have to understand, so many people, even great scholars misunderstand this, and they mistake like a hadith that's there, that's in as, as a supporting material, they think it's in the primary corpus, and they'll just assume that it's highest tier sahih and, and derive lessons from it. So the supporting material, how do you find that in Sahih al-Bukhari? So some of that he puts on the bottom, look on the bottom, chapter headings. And some of it he puts within the chapters, within the body, but towards the end of the chapter as a supporting narration. Okay. So you have to understand how muhaddithin works. So like, if there's a primary hadith, 
then sometimes they'll bring a supporting of these. Why? Because there's many reasons for that. When you start studying, you realize. Um, sometimes the primary hadith has a problem, but it's the problem is not big enough uh, to get rid of the primary hadith. It's strong, except for a small detail. So the Bukhari has an amazing examples of that. There's a strong hadith, but it's off, like about the wives of the Prophet. Instead of 11, it says 13. But the hadith is otherwise strong. So he'll put that hadith in the chapter, then he'll give a supporting hadith that's probably not as strong as that, but it's still fairly acceptable, but it corrects that mistake. So the supporting hadith, they solve certain problems. They bring additional information, but they're meant to be supporting hadith. They're not primary tier sahih. What is the grading of the supporting hadith? So it's lower tier sahih. They're still acceptable. If, if they were like weak or unacceptable, Bukhari would not include them at all. But you still have to understand primary tier sahih versus second tier sahih. So lower tier sahih, you often bring them at the ends of the chapters. They have some weakness in them, but it's still in the broad category of sahih, but a lower tier. And then chapter headings on the bottom, often he puts many of the lower tier sahih in the chapter headings. So, so what are these chapter headings? So there's something called mu'allaqat. Mu'allaqat, broadly speaking, mu'allaqat is a, so from hadith 102, mu'allaq, what's a hadith that's mu'allaq? Hanging, right, so it means hanging. Why is it called hanging, a mu'allaq hadith? Sahabi is missing, no, that would be mursal. So mu'allaq, why is it called hanging? What is a mu'allaq hadith? It's not in the Bayhoniya, but we did mention it in the class. It's not one of the lines, but it is mentioned because it's basically very simple. Uh, yeah, it would have a defect, but what is it exactly? Online, somebody wants to say? Yeah, and there uh, was no isnad connected to it? Yeah, so the sister online, Jazakallah Khair, a mu'allaq hadith is a hadith without isnad. It's an isnad less hadith. So why is it called hanging? Because in Islamic tradition, everything you reference has to be from a reference or a source. If I tell you something, it has to be coming from somewhere. Like I heard my teacher say this. I can't give you information without a source. That was a no-no. So when you quote like the Prophet without an isnad, that means you're not sourcing it. So like, this is early tradition. Now we have books, so we can just quote the Prophet say it's in Bukhari. That's slightly different, but but if you were to quote the Prophet without giving your source in early Islam, first few generations, that's mu'allaq. Your information, the information you're giving the people is hanging. It's not attached to a source. So mu'allaqat, the plural of mu'allaq, refers to those isnad less hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Or any, 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 any place, right? So, what do they represent? Why does Bukhari use Isnadla's hadith? Well, one is not in the primary corpus. The primary corpus, who would not? You would never use an Isnadla's hadith in the primary corpus, okay? But sometimes he'll do that as in the supporting material in the chapter headings. And that's what the chart shows you, the chapter heading. So Isnadla's hadith represent summarized material. So like sometimes, you know, if I'm quoting a hadith, if, you know, you go home and you, you tell your parents or some your family member ask what you learned today. You can say, oh, there was a hadith about the bell. So you just, you know, slaughtered the hadith. You didn't mention the isnad, you didn't mention the whole hadith. But is that wrong to do? No. Because when you summarize something, often you just like take a portion of it. You don't have to mention the entire isnad, the entire text every time you quote the hadith. So Bukhari, because he's trying to do so much, in the chapter headings, he uses that leeway. So he just summarizes a hadith often. So he'll just mention the hadith without mentioning the isnad. Only in the chapter headings. When he does that, that's not meant to be part of his primary corpus. Keep that in mind. So, so those hadith that are isnad less in the chapter headings, in the first column on the bottom, either they represent summarized material from the sahih itself, so that same hadith is in the Sahih in the primary corpus with the full isnad. 
But now Bukhari doesn't want to repeat the full usna, so he'll put in the chapter heading just with the text. So what would that represent? That's a primary, high, highest tier sahih because it's already in the primary corpus. But there are many hadith that he uses that represent summarized hadith from his other books or from other sources, or the hadith that he knows. They're not part of the primary corpus. When they're not part of the primary corpus, and they're only in his chapter headings as muallaqa, that's the final row here. Um, online, this would be right here, final row. Um, they, would, they would be considered lower tier sahih, or even potentially weak. And there's no problem with that because Bukhari is not putting them in his primary corpus. He's not claiming that they're a sahra sahih. So when you don't understand that, then it leads to so much confusion and problems. Okay. Um, it's not as always available. Hadith don't get invented without, but it's not written. It's not available in the sahih possibly. Like in this first category, it is available. Like if it's, if the hadith is found in the Sahih already, then you can find this now. You just have to look up that hadith. But if the hadith is not in the primary corpus, there are many examples of that. Then what happens is, this nad is available, but in other books, not in Sahih Bukhari. So this nad is there. And Bukhari's conclusion is that it doesn't fit his primary criteria. It doesn't fit. It's not fit enough to be in the primary corpus because it has some problems. That's why... But it's still not... Uh, Problems are not enough for him to eliminate it. He still is fairly acceptable for him. So he'll bring it in a supporting capacity. And that's something brilliant. That's so academic. Like people either accept or reject something. And, and you know, like some people, they look at all hadith and they just use whatever they want. They build up their own understanding from the whole hadith at their disposal. Other people I look at all most acceptable hadith and as long as somebody said it's okay, it's good enough for me. No, Bukhari had strict criteria. Some of these hadith proved his points, but he wouldn't put it in the primary corpus because he knows it's not that strong. So he'll put it in the chapter heading for you to just know that some of the evidence out there that might be acceptable is fairly acceptable, but it will never fit his primary condition. He will never put it in his primary corpus. So is it still listed as Bukhari 3003 or whatever? So that it depends on whoever listed. So most of these publishers, they don't understand this. So they'll list all of them as number one. To, sometimes they often put numbers on it, and that's wrong. So a lot of people look, this hadith is in Bukhari, and it's actually a mullah hadith. It's an isnadless hadith. Bukhari never meant to say that it's the strongest hadith. Many, many examples of that. So, uh, yeah. So, so from now on, if I see a hadith that says Bukhari with a number after it, no, it's probably okay, but it's, it's not 100%, no. So the Mu'alaqat hadith are not that many. It's about, um, I have a number, I'll give you the number. But yeah, just because someone says it's in Bukhari doesn't mean it's necessarily so. so you don't trust anybody. That, I want to make you all skeptics. No, no, no. I'm saying like sometimes you'll look up in Sunnah Dhaqqa, for example, Bukhari, the number, and then that's, you know, you confirm the hadith that's there. But that number, and it'll say number one, that's what I'm trying to teach you how to recognize mu'allaqat hadith and where do you see them so I'll show you example how do you recognize you have to know how to recognize it's not that simple Bukhari won't say mu'allaq following so he's too much of a thinker to do that he wants you to think so so it's fairly obvious but not fully obvious yeah what happened? Yeah, you'll have either a partial isnad or the Bukhari won't quote his teacher. So, for instance, an example would be Qala Umar. You know, something. So, Bukhari in chapter 1 will say, Umar said the following, a statement from Umar. And he just says, Qala Umar. So, that's Mu'allad because Bukhari doesn't quote his teacher from his teacher is going back to Umar. So, that's, that's a Mu'allad hadith. The so, Mu'allad hadith generally begin with Qala. He said, instead of haddathana, that's one clue uh, that is mu'allaq. So it's sometimes obvious. And sometimes Bukhari will use ambiguous terminology, like relating the hadith. So he'll, instead of saying haddathana, he'll say ruwiya'an. It has been narrated that this person said. It's like a passive tense, ruwiya. So this sigat al-tamrid, it's like basically 
a form that's more ambiguous. So these are clues that uh, these are mu'allak, and they'll be in the chapter headings. So the only problem is the chapter heading is long, and then the hadith begins. If the addition you have doesn't make a clear demarcation, then it's sometimes confusing. Is this part of the chapter heading, or the hadith began now? And it all depends the publisher, what he did. So not every publisher, publishers are about money, most of them. They're not into research, so a lot of the publishings are like faulty. They have a lot of mistakes in them because they're just trying to pump out the books and they're not really researching. So, but some of the good editions, they'll tell you, you know, like Darut Tasir and others. Um, Can you repeat the part of the chapter heading? So that's the chapter heading. That's where these hadith are found, the Mu'allaqat hadith. They're found in the chapter headings, in the Tarajim al abwa and then, after Bukhari relates all those, then he begins the chapter itself with the first hadith, Haddathana. So it's kind of like clear, like the primary corpus is separate from the chapter heading. So if you are publishing it today, you should put like a different font and try to make it clear because the modern audience doesn't recognize that. So like, if you look up, open up your Sahih Bukhari. Uh, so you can see uh, any one of yours, just go ahead, flip through. So you have Bab Hadathana. So Bab, that's the chapter heading. And Hadathana, there's no information there, but you'll find some, it'll say Bab, and it's a long paragraph, before the Hadathana. So that all is a chapter heading. Hadathana is where the Hadith begins. Prior to that is a chapter heading. Okay. Um, and in that chapter heading, sometimes there are Hadith without Isnads. That's what those Mu'allaqat are. Um, yeah. Untitled, yeah. If there's no words, that's an untitled Bab. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's more so. That's rare. Okay, so supporting narration within the chapters. So Imam Muslim does that a lot. In every chapter, he'll bring the strongest hadith, then less strong, and in the end, he'll put a weak hadith. But why does he do that to show you his weakness? Here are all the strong hadith, and this is why this is weak. People don't understand that, they consider all the hadith to be strong, and they'll say, Muslim related this hadith. So, that's the, that's the way muhaddithin operate. Like, that's generally, you, you bring the usul, the primary text on the topic, and you bring supporting text, and sometimes you bring the mu'allal text, reports. So, Bukhari does that rarely. So, sometimes the mu'allaqat hadith is at the end of the chapter rather than the chapter heading. But you'll still recognize it by the word qala, or rubi'an, or... It won't say like Haddathana. Yeah, yeah. It's primarily in the chapter heading, so he does it rarely, but he still occasionally does it by adding at the end of the chapter. Yeah. Who does that? Um, Neil Altar. Neil Altar, yeah. I haven't read that book a lot, though. Mm -hmm. But it's the same system. Yeah, so this is the system of the Muhaddithin. That is all Hadith experts. That's the way they constructed book. So, the best way to understand, okay, you know what? Um, look at this. Um, let me show you the structure of Sahih Muslim. And that way, this is the structure of Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim, you have, you don't have chapter headings. So it's not that complicated. Clear chapters, you have usul, primary corpus. Then you have hadith number four or five in the chapter would be supporting material, mutabahat. And then, not every chapter, but a lot of chapters, the last hadith or the ending hadith will be a weak narration, defective narration. So this is how a classical hadith work is structured. Um, There's a verse of poetry about Bukhari and Muslim and the difference. So like, I always remember the second line. I was, that's, that's, that's with verses and hadith. The second line, كَمَا فَاقَ الْمُسْلِمُ فِي حُسْنِ صِنَعَاتِهِ So, um, Bukhari excelled 
in producing an amazing structure of, of hadith to teach you so many things, just as Muslim excelled in per producing the perfect craftsmanship of a hadith book. So what Muslim did, he gave you that quintessential Sahih hadith book, written on the pattern of the hadithin, hadith experts. The best example of a hadith book written on the classical pattern is Imam Muslims. And it's clearly structured in this way. Usul, followed by mutaba'at, and then occasionally mu'allal hadith at the end. Every chapter is like that. But mu'allal, he doesn't have it in every chapter. So this is how you construct a classical hadith book. Bukhari did this, but he wanted to do much more. So that's why he's all over the place. He's bringing, he created this system of chapter headings. That was his system, for better or worse. But it was brilliant. What he gave you was much more. It's brilliant and insightful what he's trying to do. And he's teaching you between the lines through the isnad and like you know, what he brings first. It's, there's much more depth and thinking and genius in Sahih al-Bukhari than there is in the others. So one good way of, of so Bukhari and Muslim were both hadith experts. Muslim was a student of Bukhari um, and they're both great experts. So generally they agreed on most things. Sometimes they disagreed. So that's why you have this, what does muttafaqun ali mean? It's a great category. Hadith is agreed upon. Muttafaqun ali. What does that mean? Bukhari and Muslim, yeah. So there are many hadith that are both Bukhari and Muslim. When you find that, that is solid. Like both the best experts in the world, they agreed on hadith. Um, but then there's many hadith that are only in Bukhari, not in Muslim, and there's some hadith that are only in Muslim, not in Bukhari. That represents a difference of opinion among the great experts. So generally, thank God, the greater body is identical, the same. But then there is difference of opinion. Because it, it is fairly subjective, not entirely subjective. So, for instance, one difference between Bukhari and Muslim, Bukhari privileged academic accuracy. Muslim privileged moral. So, Dabt was more important for Bukhari. Adel was more important for Muslim. Uh, although both were important for both. But an example of that would be Bukhari would, because he's so confident, he'll narrate a hadith from someone who was accused of bid'ah. So he might not, there's some hadith he narrates from people who are considered to be Shia. Bukhari. Muslim would never do that. Muslim was so, uh, he had a different approach, like he had a different priority. For him, anyone accused of heresy, bid'ah, he'll eliminate him. Bukhari, he says, I want to know if this person, what he said, is a lie or not. If what he said is true, and it is not as solid, despite who he was, despite his heresy, um, he would take the hadith. As long as he's certain about the hadith, he wouldn't take everything from them. So Bukhari was criticized over that, and a Muslim had a different approach. So that's one difference between two great minds. At the end of the day, you have great minds and they will always differ. There will always be some natural differences. But this structure, look at this structure. So, to learn hadith, if you want to know the, the strong hadith on a topic, one way is looking at Sahih Muslim, just to know what the foundational hadith on this topic, the strongest hadith. Then you go to Bukhari and see what he was doing with it. Because Bukhari took that and he did much more. And he rearranged them and things like that. So you learn so much like that. So, Allah So that kind of would answer your question. And I forgot Ibrahim's question, but I think it was along these lines. So, what else do I have? Yeah, that's all I have on the structure. Any questions? Recognize what? So that's the problem. The primary corpus versus secondary corpus is not easy. It's not hard either, but it requires some thinking. And a lot of confusion, a lot of the disputes between ulama, a lot of the problems of grading of hadith um, stem from a lack of recognition of that. So, for instance, you know, uh, great contemporary muhaddith, Sheikh Albani, rahimullah. He was known to go through this authentication of hadith and he applied that to Bukhari and Muslim. 
So there are a number of hadith that he criticized in Sahih Muslim, and they cause an uproar in the Ummah. So the people who hate him, uh, ideologically, they use that to disparage, look at this person, like he's, who is he to criticize Bukhari Muslim, and then others defended him. But some of those hadith, or many of the hadith he criticized, they're not in the primary corpus, so he didn't understand the difference on some of these cases. So that's where, like, what problem can be created from not recognizing the difference. So, um, and the same thing with, like, you know, the famous, I always come to that, we'll do a detailed analysis later, but, you know, I was mentioned, what's the famous hadith I mentioned? That people say it's in Bukhari and it's not. Music, yeah, the hadith uh, prohibiting musical instruments. It's always quoted to be in Bukhari. It's a snadless hadith. Uh, the part about the musical instrument is extremely weak. And Bukhari knew it was weak, but he just quoted the hadith in the chapter of drinks. Because a portion of the hadith, sometimes a portion of a hadith is strong, another portion is not. So he felt a portion of the hadith that describes the drinks, khamar. That portion was strong um, enough, not high tier sahih, strong enough to put in a chapter heading to give you a secondary support for a point. That has nothing to do with music. But the hadith also mentions music, and now at the end of time, people quoting music instruments haram based on Bukhari. I'm not saying music instruments are not haram. I'm not saying they're halal. I'm not going to give you an answer. That's you have to figure out and research. But all I can tell you, it is not in Bukhari. Hadith that prohibits musical instruments is not strong. There's no strong, explicit hadith prohibiting musical instruments. They're indirect stuff. So based on that, lot, some of my teachers, their opinion was musical instruments are not haram at all. A few, but majority still consider them haram based on other evidence. But it's not accurate to say it's in Bukhari because it's not in the primary corpus. It's in the secondary corpus. It's even in a place where Bukhari... Uh, quotes the other portion of the hadith and proves it. Had the musical instrument part considered to be acceptable for him, he would have put that hadith in the part about music. Not about, There's no chapter of music, but about idle talk and things like that. It would fit more there, and he doesn't include it there because he doesn't consider that portion to be sound. So you have to be accurate in your arguments, so that requires a deep understanding of these books. That's what we're trying to do here. Yeah, you guys mind using the microphone? Um, so is it safe to say to some extent that Sahih Muslim is easier to study for the beginning student knowledge or just for the layman? I was thinking about the, um, the hadith about the Prophet Salam wanting to jump from the mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, in Bukhari, and over there, if I remember correctly, he, he makes it clear it's not hadathana, hadathana, it's, it's been reported. All right. But then Muslim leaves out that entire section to yeah. kind of like avoid the confusion. Yeah, so in that sense, definitely Sahih Muslim is much easier to study. Um, but the thing is, you know, if your goal is this, and your goal is, you know, in the stars, it's a very different goal. So I don't, you know, shouldn't use that to disparage Sahih Bukhari, but definitely. If you're looking to look at the most authentic hadith in a systematic way, you want to find all the hadith on one topic, Sahih Muslim is your book. Because on one topic, you'll put all the hadith there. Bukhari, you'll put it all over the place. But what you achieve with Bukhari is much more. It requires thinking and more expertise, for sure. That's why Husna Sana'a, perfect craftsmanship, is Sahih Muslim. But that broader vision creating something incredible, that's Imam al-Bukhari. Anyone else? There are a couple of hands, but the microphone went around, the hands went down. Yeah. Like how do they have it separate? Like, how do you know? Like it's, um, it's, it's not numbered, you mean? It's not numbered, yeah. It's like, it says, Bab ma yudkabu fil fakhid, right? Talking about the mm -hmm. thigh. Mm -hmm. And then it starts, wa yurwa an ibn Abbas, and it, like that, it has that whole beginning section. And it's not translated, right? It's not translated. Yeah, yeah. And then it goes to hadathana as like a separate thing. So, 
That's how it is for all the chapters. So yeah, so so um, Sunnah.com generally the chapter headings are not translated of Bukhari. So I often notice that earlier too. So they do separate. Now the question is, are they accurate on that separation always? Sometimes not, it's not easy to recognize. Uh, <clears throat> let me give you the facts about Mu'allaq reports. How many Mu'allaq hadith are there in Bukhari? Anyone know? So this is Ibn Hajar's research. What do you think? Like, give me ballpark. 30. If it was 30 hadith, we would have this whole discussion. For 30 hadith. <laughs> so 30 is off because it's a huge phenomenon. Everyone's like, up. Oh, it's, it's something everyone studies. It wouldn't be that small. 500, good. That's a better guess. Go higher. Okay. It's 1,341. So total mu'alla hadith, it's not less hadith in Sahih Bukhari. This is, so it would depend on which manuscript you're using, because sometimes some hadith are off, um, and also depends on the counting, the way you count. Sometimes one hadith, some will consider as two. So this is Ibn Hajar's research. So these numbers are, it's good to quote them, and this is Ibn Hajar's research. 1,341 mu'alla reports in Bukhari. So... How many of them are just a summary of hadith that appear in the primary corpus versus hadith that are not in his primary corpus at all? It was a split. What do you think? <clears throat> so actually, out of these 1,341, <clears throat> the majority of them appear in the primary corpus as well. So they're just repeated in the Malakat in the chapter headings without Islam. But they do appear in the primary corpus. So only Ibn Hajr counted 160 Mu'allaq hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that don't appear in the primary corpus, so that are not on his conditions. So the number is actually fairly small. So 160 are the exclusively Mu'allaq hadith that are not appearing in the primary corpus. How many, <clears throat> okay, you know what, let me end with the numbers. I'll put them on the board. I'll put the numbers on the board. I would want to stop the sharing, and it stops the recording. Okay. Okay. So I'll end with numbers. I'll put these numbers on the board, as long as this thing follows me. I don't want this camera to follow me to the board. Okay, there we go. What is the number I gave you? 1,000? 341. No, I How many exclusive in Wada? 160. I'll put second here, Safi. And then let me give you some other numbers. Let me have that microphone. Camera didn't follow. Oh, it didn't follow. Okay. Okay. Okay, it is following now. How many total? Hadith? Uh, total hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Seven thousand three hundred and ninety seven. This is Ibn Hajar's research. Seven thousand three hundred and ninety seven total. Markers. 
So total number of hadith, um, excluding mu'allaf reports, um, in the primary corpus, 7,397. These are primary corpus, okay, usul. Forget, forget about, let me scratch that. It's confusing you. Just put primary corpus. Primary corpus hadith 7,397, according to uh, Ibn Hajar, primary corpus. 1,341 is snadless. Most of them are already in the primary corpus. You can subtract to see how much. 160, not in the primary corpus. And then how many supporting reports? Mutabaat, 341 supporting reports. Okay. Supporting. Supporting are like within the body of the book, in the primary corpus, you have the primary hadith, but then you say tabaru. You bring like a hadith that's lesser, it's not primary grade, sorry, but it just comes after a primary hadith in an obvious way to show you. Uh, or give you some additional information, or to remedy a problem. And then, total number, if you add all of them up, 9,082. That's the total. 9,082 reports, including reporting reports and uh, So this is a good summary of the research of Ibn Hajar, just in terms of numbers, okay? Um, any questions? So, yes. So the hadith on um, the musical instruments, that's from the supporting reports? No, that's even worse than supporting report. No. It's mu'allaq. Yes. So mu'allaq, it's mu'allaq, but it's, it's that portion extremely weak. So, alhamdulillah, that was the structure of the Sahih. Hopefully, you have some appreciation what Sahih Bukhari is and what its structure looks like. Um, any questions? Okay, where's my chat box? 160 is the number of exclusively Mu'allaq hadith that don't appear in the primary corpus. Yes, I'm John. That's not his style, no. My Muslim does, like the Mu'allal Hadith, but Ma Bukhari, no. Like he generally includes Hadith, like supporting, uh, in some supporting capacity. So it has some level of acceptability for him. So Mu'allal, no, I don't think so. Yeah, so but so that hadith we're gonna talk about it's in it's in the first chapter, right? Yeah. I mean I was looking that up somehow, it came to my mind to look that up. I was looking up the first chapter, I didn't find it, but I thought it was in the first chapter. It was gonna be part of the hadith we study. I I believe, but somehow I didn't find it in here. Maybe I didn't read hard enough. But that is in primary corpus, so it looks like he did accept it, but he was accurate to tell you that it's like from like Zuhuri and stuff. So it doesn't look like it was related to show you his weakness. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah. The 160 exclusive Mu'allaq are other than the 1341 Mu'allaq? No, it's part of that, of those. That's why there's an arrow there. So that's telling you that Mu'allaq, just because a hadith is Mu'allaq doesn't mean it's automatically not Sahih because many of them are already in the Sahih. He just wants to summarize them in the chapter heading. He doesn't want to include them in the chapter for some reason. He'll put in the chapter heading, but it's already in the Sahih. But one sixty are weaker. They're not primary tier Sahih. They're just Mu'allaq. They don't appear anyone as is Sahih. You have no isnads in his Sahih. You'll find isnads. So Ibn Hajar he wrote a book, Taghlid, um, 
um, blanking out on the name of his book, but he wrote a book documenting these 160 narrations. Um, there is nuts from other works. So he documented it's not for all of them, and he said they're all sound. Um, I think it's Tagalih or Tagalih. Yeah, it's Tagalik or Ta'alik. Is uh, that's the name of his book? Yeah, yeah. So Mu'allaq, it's kind of complex. So you sometimes they'll just say Qala Fulan. This Sheikh says so and so. This scholar or this Sahabi said so and so. Or even the Prophet says so with the word Qala. But often it's quoting like part of the Isnad. Qala Zuhri, Qala Hada. You know, so. But it's, the point is it doesn't have the Bukhari's teacher with the entire Isnad. It might be no Isnad or it might be a partial Isnad skipping Bukhari's teacher. So he's not linking himself to that. He's just giving it to you in a suspended way. That's what Mu'allaq are. And there are various levels of soundness, the Mu'allaqah. So most of them are considered to be second tier Sahih, the 160. But there are a handful that could be Hassan or weak. So there could be, you know, and some of them are, like just a handful of them are Da'if. So in the Mu'allaqah, the exclusive Mu'allaqah. But generally speaking, most of them are second tier Sahih. Even Hajj was emotional, he said they're all Sahih. And these are the Isnads. He defended all, he said there's not a single hadith there that's not sahih. But I think if you put, if you just put a lump of them all together, then you don't appreciate Bukhari's distinction, right? So they're not strong, according to Bukhari. That's why he did that distinction to put them separately. If you consider all of them to be fully sahih, then what's the point of making chapter headings? So you have to have that distinction that these are less sahih or even potentially weak. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're not fabricated or they're not like that. So Bukhari did accept them at some level with the gradation. That's why, you know, you have to be accurate. You have to be like the early Muslims. Like they were accurate and academic. You have to know what's solid and what is less solid. But if you treat everything at the same and, and get emotional and treat hadith as sacred text, all of them, then it's not that accurate. So we have that precision in our understanding of things, so. Anyone else? Okay, Fatah Allah alaykum. We continue tomorrow. Jazakumullah khairum. Assalamu alaykum.